The essential purpose of the seven habits of highly effective people is to learn how to lead your life in a truly effective way. To describe what the seven habits material is, let me share with you what it is not. It is not a quick fix program. It is not a program of the month. It is a process of personal and interpersonal growth and development that will require not only your continuing best efforts, but also your patience. As we all know, real growth and development cannot take place overnight. You must pay the price over an extended period of time to reap the benefits of these habits. Implementing the seven habits will be an upward personal climb like a journey up a steep mountain. It won't be easy. It will be a challenge. As you ascend the mountain, so to speak, with the seven habits material, you'll become acutely aware of the loose gravel, you know, the loose rocks in your life. You may slip occasionally, maybe even fall back a time or two. You will feel the gravity pull of old habits working against you. But I'll assure you, as you continue in your climb and endure in your efforts, you will begin to feel a level of exhilaration and of attaining entirely new heights in your life, higher and higher levels of effectiveness. By applying this effort, you can expect to increase your capacity to achieve your personal and professional goals and to develop better working relationships with your associates and all of your loved ones. In short, you can expect to become more effective. Let me suggest that the best way to get the most out of the seven habits is to be very open-minded, to be open to self-discovery. Participate, really get involved. Look for ways to apply and to implement these habits in your life. You see, our habits form our character. You may have heard the quote, sow a thought, reap an action. Sow an action, reap a habit. Sow a habit, reap a character. Sow a character, reap a destiny. For our purposes, we will define a habit as the intersection of knowledge, skill, and desire. You see, knowledge is the theoretical component. That is the what to do and the why to do it. Skill is the practical side of how to do it. And desire is the motivation side, the want to do it. In order to make something a habit in our lives, we literally must have all three components. Habits are powerful factors in our lives. They constantly express our character. They determine the level of our effectiveness or our ineffectiveness. In the words of an English poet, we first make our habits, then our habits make us. The seven habits are simply common sense, common sense organized. But remember, what is common sense is not always common practice. So I encourage you to make the investment, put forth the time and effort. Focus on the kinds of changes you can make consistently and over time to develop these habits. I wanted to study the success idea in America and how it evolved. So I got into the popular success literature going back for 200 years. This included many, many books, magazine articles, annotated bibliographies, summaries, reviews. I literally tapped into thousands and thousands of sources, either directly or indirectly. As I worked, I started to sense a pattern. As soon as I sensed this pattern, I looked for evidence of it, and the evidence was everywhere. The basic finding was this. For the first 150 years, almost the entire focus of the literature was on character, on principles, on what we might call the character ethic. Attributes such as integrity, fidelity, courage, compassion, contribution, responsibility, justice, these findings became the basis for writing the seven habits of highly effective people. And then, because of many, many societal forces, the emphasis gradually shifted in the early 1900s, particularly in the 20s and the 30s, away from the character ethic to what we might call the personality ethic, which focused more on techniques 
than on principles. You are probably familiar with many books that illustrate the literature of the personality ethic. They basically deal with how to take care of yourself, how to look good, how to dress in particular ways, how to create the right image. In other words, the personality ethic focuses on how to appear to be rather than on how to actually be. Many of these techniques have real merit. However, if they don't have their roots in the character ethic, if they don't have their roots in principles, they won't have the power to create enduring effectiveness. For example, what if people learn techniques of influencing others, but they're fundamentally duplicitous or deceitful in their character? What if they really wanted to use people to build their own economic success? They might develop smoothness in their relationships so that they can have their own personal ends achieved, money, fame, glory, whatever. They really couldn't care less about contribution or service, purpose, adding value, helping others. How much trust would you have in them? How willing would you be to follow them or to rely upon them when things get tough? You know, one time I had a student come to me and say, how am I doing in your class? I looked him in the eye and said, you really know how you're doing, don't you? A lot better than I do. How are you doing? And he kind of looked down squeamishly. Well, not too good, I guess. I just had kind of a rough time lately and maybe I haven't applied myself as much as I should have. You really came to find out how well you'd psyched me out, how well you'd psyched out the system, isn't that right? When in fact, you kind of know in your heart how you're doing. Well, how am I doing, he said. How are you doing? Let's focus on what's really happening, not on what's appearing to happen. You see, this whole personality ethic with its technique focus is like the tip of an iceberg. The tip, or that part which is seen on the surface by others, it's above the water. The character ethic is like the great mass of the iceberg under the water. People often do no work in the foundation where the great mass is, where the greatest long-term impact is. Too many people give all their energy and focus to the tip of the iceberg, that is to learning techniques that others can see. You see this even in organizations, not just individuals. You see programs change, practices change, principles do not change. If we help individuals and organizations to internalize principles, they will know how to adapt the practices to address specific situations. Let me emphasize that techniques have their place. They're very important. I really mean that. I mean, you want good human relations techniques, public relations techniques, communication techniques, management techniques. But when we use techniques to cover our own lack of character, they become manipulative. They undermine trust and confidence. You see, what we really need is the character ethic. And that's essentially what the seven habits is about. This material is based on an inside-out approach, meaning we give our first energies to our own character development before we focus on techniques or how to be more effective with others. Gandhi beautifully demonstrated this principle once. A mother came to him and said, would you help my child reduce the amount of sugar he is eating? Gandhi paused, thought, and answered, well, Talk to me in a week. A week later, the mother asked him again, and he talked to the boy, and the boy agreed. And the mother said, why didn't you talk with him last week? Gandhi smiled and said, you don't understand. Last week, I too was eating sugar. Unless we work on our character, we will not develop trustworthiness. And trustworthiness is built by the combination of both character and competency. We could have all of the ability in the world, 
But if we don't have the basic character to be reliable, to take responsibility, others will soon learn to distrust us. They're fearing that we are just trying to meet our own ends, perhaps at their expense. In my opinion, unless we return to the character ethic, we won't have the basic foundation of trustworthiness. That's what leads to trust, which is needed to build effective interpersonal relationships. In the final analysis, what we are communicates far more eloquently than anything we say or do. I love the quote of Henry David Thoreau. For every thousand hacking at the leaves of evil, there is one striking at the root. In other words, let's work primarily on the roots to begin with and build a foundation of trustworthiness. This is one of the key areas of focus in the seven habits, to build character and competence and to restore trustworthiness and trust in our lives, in the lives of our families, our organizations. Trust and trustworthiness really are the basis of personal and interpersonal leadership. It's the foundation of all true effectiveness. I would like to stand back and look at the basic structure, the basic framework of the seven habits as a whole. You see, they're organized in a particular way for a reason. They're all interrelated. In fact, the relationships and the sequence among the habits are the key to their overall power. To help us visualize the sequential and progressive nature of the seven habits, I'd like to use a simple diagram I call the maturity continuum. Maturity refers to a process leading to growth and development, and continuum refers to the continuous, incremental nature of growth and progression. If you were to see a maturity continuum line from low maturity to high maturity, there would be three basic levels to it. The first level is dependence. The second level is independence. And the third and the highest level is interdependence. Let me define these three terms very briefly. Dependence basically means you need others to get what you want. You see, all of us began life as an infant, dependent on others for nurturing and sustenance. I may be intellectually dependent on other people's thinking. I may be emotionally dependent on other people's affirmation and validation of me. Dependence is the attitude of you. You take care of me. You come through for me. Or you don't come through. I blame you for the results. Independence basically means you are pretty much free from the external influence, the control, and the support of others. You think, you act for yourself. You're validated from within. You're inner-directed. You're self-reliant. You get what you want through your own effort. Like dependence, it is possible to be independent in various areas, physically, financially, intellectually, emotionally, while not being independent in other areas. Independence is the attitude of I. I can do it. I am responsible. I am self-reliant. I can choose. True independence of character empowers us to act rather than to be acted upon. It frees us from our dependence on circumstances and other people. It is the avowed goal of many individuals and also many social movements to enthrone independence as the highest level of achievement. But it is not the ultimate goal in effective living. There is a far more mature, more advanced level. The third and highest level in the maturity continuum is interdependence. If people were interdependent, what would they be? They would be very much like a marriage, a family, an executive team where they need to cooperate together in order to accomplish what I want, what you want, what we want together. In fact, we live in an interdependent reality. Interdependence is essential for good leaders, good team players, 
for success in marriage, for family life and organizations. Interdependence is the attitude of we. We can cooperate. We can be a team. We can combine our talents, our abilities, our best efforts to achieve our highest success. Now here is the basic insight. Think on this. Until you and I are independent, we cannot be interdependent. Let me say that again. Until you and I are independent, we cannot be interdependent. In other words, we can't do calculus before we understand algebra. We can't run before we learn to walk. We neither can learn to work cooperatively with other people if we don't have internal self-mastery. That's why the first three habits, be proactive, begin with the end in mind, and put first things first, deal with self-mastery, self-control, self-dominion. They form the deepest part of our character. They constitute what I call the private victory, the victory over self. You see, Private victories must precede public victories. To lead others effectively, we first must be able to lead ourselves effectively. For example, when I make a commitment to get up early and exercise, and I literally carry it out, I feel better. I feel better about myself. I have greater emotional strength. I have better physical energy. You see what that means? A private victory. As a result, I do better in all my relationships with others. That's the public victory. However, have you ever noticed the tendency to be irritable with others after failing to keep a commitment to yourself? I know speaking for myself, I can usually trace my weaknesses, my failures in dealing with others to some flaw, some failure to win my own private victory. These first three habits lead us from dependence to independence then once people have control over themselves and have a measure of independence, they're ready to deal with the next three habits. Think win-win. Seek first to understand, then to be understood, and synergize, all of which helps us in our relationships with others, enabling us to be successful with people. Habits four, five, and six develop what I call the public victory effectiveness with others. It's based on teamwork, on cooperation, and communication. Habits four, five, and six utilize our personality. They're more skill-based, and they lead us from independence to interdependence. That is the attitude of we, where we cooperate to accomplish desired results. Then habit seven, sharpen the saw, is the habit of renewal, of regular, balanced renewal in all of the dimensions of our life. It surrounds and encompasses all of the other habits. It is the habit of continuous improvement that creates an upward spiral of growth and development. Now interdependence is a choice that only independent people can make. For instance, let's say you're my supervisor and I'm very dependent upon your opinion of me. I'm also dependent financially and intellectually upon you. But let's say you have some blind spots in your performance and you really need feedback. I'm aware of your blind spots. I also have enough skill to give you feedback. But would I do it? I wouldn't. I'm too dependent upon you. I'm too angry at you. I'm mad because those blind spots hurt me. I have what's often called a love-hate relationship. You see, the person you're dependent upon also controls you. If you don't get what you want, it makes you mad. So I wouldn't possibly give you honest feedback. I don't want to rupture my relationship with you. So what do I do? I talk to others, and then they share their experiences, and they validate me, and we badmouth you. We're simply not interdependent. If I were truly interdependent, that means if I'm first of all independent, I could go to you and I could say, could we have a visit? I would like to share some of my concerns. But if you were dependent yourself and used to borrowing strength from your position power, you might try to intimidate me. You might say, well, what is it, Stephen? Let's get to it right now. What are your concerns? 
On the other hand, if I'm emotionally and intellectually independent from you, I could be courageous and kind at the same time. I'm patient. I don't give up, but I don't give in. I could say, we need a little more time where we're not going to be interrupted. Let's do it at our mutual convenience. You would sense that you're dealing with a person of integrity, a power of strength, of courage. You would also know from my professional development opportunities and the way I have exercised them, I've got about 10 other jobs I could go to at any time. You probably also know I'm the only one in your crew that isn't bad-mouthing you. I have no need to bad-mouth. I have no energy around your weaknesses. I don't want to do something to hurt you. I don't want to do something to help you, to overcome your weaknesses, or perhaps help you compensate for the deficiency in some way. So I'm most positive person on your entire team. I'm most, almost indispensable to you. Now the first three habits develop that kind of strength, courage, and capacity. The next three habits help me know how to work effectively with you so that my strength does not intimidate you. I can empathize with you. I can read the needs of the situation and figure out the best way to make the presentation so that the two of us can cooperate together and solve the problem. You would see me as the best source of problem solving on your entire team. Interdependence is where real freedom is. That's where excitement is. That's where adventure is. Their very best comes to the fore. That's the maturity continuum, the adventure of building powerful, interdependent relationships, interdependent teams. A brief overview of each of the habits. It's like getting a kind of airplane view of the whole mountain range before we go down to explore the detail. Habit one, be proactive, basically means that your life is a product of your values, not your feelings. That your life or the organization's life is a product of your decisions not your conditions. The opposite of being proactive is to be reactive, which basically means that your life is a function of your feelings, your moods, your impulses, other people's treatment. The underlying principle of habit one, be proactive, is to take responsibility. The concept is, you and I have the capacity to choose our response. Habit two, begin with the end in mind, basically means that all things are created twice, and habit two is the first creation. Habit two, begin with the end in mind, means that you get a mental image, a picture, of where you want to end up in this meeting, in this relationship, this year, in your life, to accompany it is the vision it has of its future. It is the creation of that vision. Habit two is based on the principle of vision, of purpose, of meaning, of mission. Habit three to put first things first is the second creation. To put first things first means you decided what the first things were in habit two, now you have the discipline and the commitment to keep them first. The opposite of putting first things first is to put second or third or fourth things first. That's why many people really deeply value their family relationships, their health, their personal integrity. But they get caught up in the powerful social value systems, timetables and agendas of their culture. Never question it. 
so that the first creation has already been done for them, done to them in the form of programs, scripts that they never question. Then they get on this ladder of success and they arrive at the top rung only then to realize the ladder is leaning against the wrong wall. They come to realize that no one on their deathbed ever wished they'd spent more time at the office. As Goethe put it, things which matter most must never be at the mercy of things which matter least. Habit four, think win-win, is the habit of mutual benefit. The underlying paradigm or principle is abundance. There is plenty out there and to spare. So you don't have to be threatened by the strengths of other people. You can nurture competency around you higher than your own. It doesn't threaten you. You can share knowledge. You can share recognition, gain, profit. The opposite is scarcity, not abundance like a piece of pie there's only so much if you get the recognition I may not get it if I share gain or profit with you I we will have less habit for to think win-win comes from the principle of abundance not scarcity meaning the pie gets larger and larger and larger habit five seek first to understand then to be understood is the habit of empathic communication, meaning you always seek to understand first. The teacher diagnoses, pre-assesses before teaching. The doctor diagnoses before prescribing. The attorney does discovery before developing his or her own case or brief. Understand first before you seek to be understood, before you seek to contribute before you take action, before you have the basis for judgment. Habit six, synergize, is the habit of creative cooperation, seeking to understand. We create something that was not there before. That takes high levels of cooperation. The principle behind habit six is the principle that one plus one can equal three, four, 10, 20, 1,000. It's the principle of putting two boards together that are stronger in total than adding the sum of the boards separate. It's the principle of valuing differences, not tolerating differences, not accepting differences, celebrating differences. Habit seven is called sharpen the saw. It is the principle of renewal the principle of continuous learning, continuous improvement, getting better constantly. It's based on the principle that we have the capability of charging our own battery. The opposite of habit seven, sharpen the saw, is to just let the blade get dull, to let the mind atrophy, to let the body lose its tone and its vitality through junk food and no exercise and trying to live a life of hedonism, pleasure seeking, rather than one of contribution and service. It renews each of the other six habits. The three person process is this. The best way to learn something is to teach it. How many have learned that? How many have learned that when you really teach is when you really learn? In five minutes, you will be teaching what I'm teaching you in the next five minutes. See yourself now as a teacher. I'm going to briefly describe the three-person process and the four benefits that come from the three-person process. Now, notice your behavior right now. See, you don't see yourself 
as a kind of passive learner. You see yourself as an active teacher. You're just preparing to teach. And that significantly increases your learning. That is the first benefit. The first person teaches. The second person first captures, understands, then evaluates to see if it makes sense, thinks about application, and then teaches the third person. Then that person teaches another person. This way you can take material and cascade it through an entire organization. Second benefit. When you teach, you significantly increase the likelihood of application. For instance, if you're teaching people to be better listeners, isn't it probable that you'll try to be a better listener yourself? See, the real most foundational learning comes from doing. Teaching may give you more intellectual understanding, but the internalization of the ideas comes in the application of those ideas. That's even a higher level of learning. Third benefit, when you teach, you significantly improve communication. Notice the three-person process there. Why do you think communication would be significantly improved? Notice the first person teaches. And what does the second person do? First captures or understands before evaluating. What is the number one obstacle in the field of communication. People do not listen. They do not capture accurately. They evaluate while they're listening. But if people are trained to capture accurately, completely, before they judge, you can listen for purpose, main points, how each point is proven or validated, how each point is illustrated or applied, and value. The fourth benefit. When these things happen I'm talking about, it is very bonding to the relationship. The relationship gets steeper and stronger. Why? There's so much authenticity. There's so much sincerity. There is so much empathy and creativity being manifested in the communication processes. When you do this with your children, you will learn better. The next time you send somebody to a convention, to some training activity, to some association meeting, before they go, what do you say to them? When you return, you will have the privilege of distilling the essence of what you learned to the assembled staff for half an hour. You'll find they'll attend the meeting sober. <laughs> They'll take notes. From the moment you give that assignment, they will be in sweat city. Seriously, they'll go to work. All eight cylinders will go to work. It's the single most powerful thing I have ever learned in the field of education. Use the three-person process and you will double, quadruple the impact and you will see those four benefits happen. It's the essence of the process that we use, the three-person process. We have to realize that it is all based upon principles, upon natural laws. That is why we are presenting this foundational material first. We need to understand the concept of a principle and the concept of a paradigm and also how to define effectiveness. Then we'll look at the seven habits. I suggest that principles are not only natural laws, objective, factual, external to ourself. I suggest they are also self-evident. How would we know that? We have found that if you can get enough people interacting freely and synergistically who are informed, all the value systems are the same. We find 
that regardless of one's background, religion, culture, nationality, race, gender, regardless of the level in the organization, regardless of the industry or the profession, the same underlying values are universal. They represent what we could call principles. There is consensus that surrounds them, such as integrity, service, contribution, the growth and development of people, kindness, how you treat people, dignity, fairness. These are universals. Every one of the habits represents a principle, a fundamental natural law that is self-evident. Now, let me just give an illustration of the difference between a social value and principles. It was a dark and stormy night. Captain, 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 wake up. Uh, what is it? Sorry to awaken you, sir, but we have a serious problem. And we've tried to solve it and can't. What's the problem? There's a ship in our sea lane about 20 miles away that refuses to move. Well, what do you mean they refuse? Just tell them to move. We have, sir. That's the problem. They won't respond. I'll tell them. The signal goes out. Move starboard 20 degrees. The signal comes back. Move starboard 20 degrees yourself. What arrogance. <laughs> who is this guy? He doesn't know who I am. Let him know a captain is giving the command. The signal goes out. This is Captain Horatio Hornblower, the 16th. Move starboard 20 degrees at once. The signal comes back. This is Seaman Carl Jones, the third. Move starboard 20 degrees at once yourself. This is a command. A seaman commanding me, a captain. I can't believe this. What is going on? Let them know who I am. We're a battleship. We could just blow them out. The signal goes out. This is the mighty Missouri, flagship of the Seventh Fleet. Signal returns. This is the lighthouse. <laughs> you see, lighthouses are like principles. We don't break them. We break ourselves against them. This is why humility is the mother of all other virtues. Openness, teachability, humility, awareness of external realities. If you can cultivate that and apply it with other people, you'll change the whole nature of the culture. It'll become a principle-centered culture, not one driven by social values. I had a friend of mine who said, our company is value-driven. I said, every company is value-driven. Hitler was value-driven. The question is, are the values in alignment with principles? That is a humbling question. Are my values and my habits in alignment with principles, with natural laws? Now, when principles and values are aligned, then you could use the words interchangeably. You could call it values or principles, it would make no difference. So you don't want to get hung up semantically on the difference. But if, if they are not aligned, then it's better to see what the principle is and what the established value is, and then work here to align it. the law of gravity. Gradually, the whole world has come to accept that. The apple falling out of the tree and hitting the scientist's head. Simple observation. The law of gravity governs. What if you had a legislature trying to repeal the law of gravity? A principle is the actual reality like the law of gravity, the way things are. How many here, when you were in school, did a lot of cramming? 
Be honest now. How many got really good at it? How many here have ever worked on a farm? Ever cram on the farm? I don't mean just work hard at the end to bring in the harvest. I mean forget the plant in the spring, flake off all summer, and then really work hard in the end to bring in the harvest. Well, it's patently foolish, we know that. Why? Because a farm is a natural system and is governed by what? Principles or social values? Principles. What about the development of our mind? What would you say? Social values or principles? The development of the mind, not the getting of a degree. You can't fake it. The development of the mind is based on principles, the law of the harvest, not on social values, however popular. What about the body? What would you say? Social values or principles? Our health, physical, mental, spiritual, emotional, is governed by the law of the harvest, by principles, not by social values. Everything that I've been talking about is not easily achievable. It takes continuous effort. You can't fake, for instance, the ability to do 20 push-ups. You can't fake it. You have to pay the price. Next time I come back, he literally, I'm convinced, could do 25, even 50. But he'd have to pay a price to do it. It stirs up. An awareness that we're dealing with realities out there, particularly principles that ultimately will govern. We are not in control. See, the traditional concept is get in control. We are not in control. Principles control. We control our actions, but the consequences that flow from those actions are controlled by principles. As Abraham Lincoln once put it, People will pass away, but principles never will. They endure. This is why we believe so much in the Eastern statement, give a man a fish, you feed him for the day, teach him how to fish, you feed him for a lifetime. See, even though you may teach someone a practice, always try to teach the principle which underlies it, because the situation may change and the practice no longer applies. The principle will be constant. Principles are universal natural laws, self-evident, self-validating. They govern, ultimately, values don't govern. Principles ultimately govern. The Greek root paradigma, it basically means a pattern, a model, a representation something that stands for something else. It comes from the mental image you have in your mind of the way things are out there. And the images we carry in our heads of the way things are, of reality, come basically from our own backgrounds, our own experiences. All of us think we see the world as it is. In fact, we see the world as we are. We project onto the outside world, our environment, the people we associate with, including how we see ourselves. We project out of our own conditioning experiences, our background, a certain representation, a certain model, a certain set of expectations, a certain assumption on that reality out there. And we think that's the way it is. I might describe myself or you or a situation as if I am describing it as it is. In fact, I am describing myself, that is, my perceptions, my frame of reference, my worldview, my value system, my autobiography. And I'm projecting it upon the outside. 
You see, a paradigm is the map you have in your mind. Once you have an accurate map, then your behavior and your attitude matter. See, what we call maps are usually assumptions, assumptions of the way things are. Assumptions of the way things are represent just, that's what reality is. You don't question that. I remember I was giving a speech a little while back and uh, there was someone on the front row just constantly talking to another person. And my mother was two rows behind and she was so upset that here her precious son was being so ignored so blatantly, so openly, constantly, and would not end. From the very moment I began to the end of my speech, just constant talking. And it just totally discombobulated her own listening and she felt like taking her purse and reaching two rows ahead. Anyway, she went up afterwards to the person that was running the conference and did you see that? Did you see what was happening? Can you believe that right there on the front row that... Yeah, I know. She's Korean. That's her translator. <laughs> I was on a subway very, very large metropolitan city. Sunday morning, it's quiet, sedate. Bunch of young kids running in the subway. Father follows. He sits near me. The kids just go crazy on that subway, running up and down, turning people's papers aside, just raucous and rude. I'm sitting there. Oh, I can't believe this. He does nothing. I look at my attitude, see? attitude to try to control but look what I could see after a few minutes attitude went into behavior sir do you think you could control your children a little they're very upsetting to people oh yeah he lifted his head as if to come to an awareness of what was happening yeah I don't know I just guess I should uh, we just left the hospital their mother died just about an hour ago and I guess they don't know how to take it, and frankly, I don't either. Imagine the paradigm shift that took place there. Imagine now what the attitude and the behavior would be based upon that paradigm. Can you see why paradigms are deeper than attitude or behavior? And you know, even though we're talking here in personal and interpersonal ways, the same thing takes place throughout our whole society. Thomas Kuhn, in his brilliant book, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, points out so powerfully and consistently all of the significant breakthroughs were breakwiths, old ways of thinking. Einstein, who rewrote physics, he made this brilliant statement. The significant problems we face cannot be solved at the same level of thinking we were at when we created them. You see, it causes us to be reflective and introspective to explore our own paradigms. Most people focus upon behavior and upon attitude. And both of those are, of course, very important. But far more fundamental than either behavior or attitude is a paradigm.